It's my pleasure to join with you today to share some of my experiences with sulfur and nitrogen chemiluminescence detectors. I'm Randall Shearer, a researcher at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Over my long career, I've been intimately involved with gas chromatography analysis and instrument development. I've also been active in ASTM and have contributed to several standard test methods. I'm one of the many developers of the SCD technology that was originally invented by Rich Benner and Professor Stedman from the University of Denver. In this presentation, I'm going to cover principles of operation, maintenance, and troubleshooting for sulfur and nitrogen chemiluminescence detectors with gas chromatography. I need to acknowledge the support and contributions of two important individuals who have contributed to this field. Professor Sievers was one of the founders of Sievers Instruments, along with Misha Plom and Rick Huddy. The sulfur chemiluminescence detector was one of Sievers Instruments' first successful products. Professor Sievers was my research advisor way back then, and I had the opportunity to work with him multiple times over my career. Most recently, I came back to the University of Colorado to help him with his hemp research. Professor Sievers retired just a year ago in January and recently celebrated his 88th birthday. Dr. Jim Luong was one of the first customers who I met after I joined Sievers Instruments. We became friends and he recently reminded me of the incremental and revolutionary changes that we have witnessed in this area of detection. I would like to define a few terms that I will be using in this presentation. Chemiluminescence is the generation of light from a chemical reaction. It is sort of like the opposite of photosynthesis. Just as we are able to see the glowing firefly or lightning bug at night, chemiluminescence detectors like the SCD and NCD derive at least some of their high sensitivity from detection of light emission against a dark background. Now I would like to distinguish universal detection from selective detection. A universal detector responds to nearly all compounds. A selective detector responds to only certain compounds or compound classes. Generally, selective detectors are more sensitive detectors. They also don't suffer from interferences of co-loading compounds, making chromatography easier. Selective detectors may provide a uniform response for classes of compounds, simplifying calibration and quantification, especially for unknown compounds. The chromatogram on the right is from the analysis of gasoline sample that contained 30 parts per million of sulfur. I can clearly recall the odor inside the walk-in refrigerator at Shell where we kept samples like this. An example of the value of the detector is that even though we might not be able to identify each individual compound, we can obtain a measure of the total sulfur in the sample by summing the response from all peaks. And of course, we can quantify each peak individually. In this day and age, one might wonder why we don't just use mass spectrometry for all analyses. Mass spec does, for example, have properties of both universal and selective detection. Certainly mass spec has advantages, but it also has limitations, mainly which become apparent when samples contain hundreds of compounds producing ions everywhere. Of course, mass spec is perfectly able to detect and quantify species if they are well separated, like the spectra of H2S as shown on the right, which also includes a useful isotopic pattern. Selected detectors complement mass spectrometry and vice versa. Selected detectors help to screen samples for subsequent analysis. They help narrow search windows for targets and can help quantitate and calibrate mass spec. Mass spec, of course, helps identify unknowns, especially for dual simultaneous analysis. Now I want to describe the operating principles of the NCD and SCD. You'll see that their mechanisms are very similar, but I will describe key differences in the next slide. 
In the case of the NCD, a nitrogen containing compound is oxidized at high temperature to form nitric oxide. Nitric oxide reacts with an excess of ozone, so this makes it a pseudo first order reaction in nitric oxide. Nitrogen dioxide is formed in an excited state that emits infrared radiation at about 800 to 3200 nanometers. The SCD is very similar, except that the reaction of sulfur containing compounds takes place at high temperature under a reducing atmosphere so that sulfur monoxide is formed. SO plus ozone reacts similarly, but emits light in the blue region of the spectrum from about 300 to 400 nanometers. On the right hand side of the side is JP Su of Smart Chemistry. Smart Chemistry is particularly well known for trace level gaseous analysis, and they use SCDs with GC to detect sulfur compounds at part per trillion levels. In order to achieve this low level detection, they use cryogenic trapping of samples. This kind of analysis is particularly useful for application to hydrogen powered vehicles, especially those using fuel cells. This slide basically contrasts the NCD with the SCD and will help you to understand instrumental differences between these detectors. The NCD uses oxidative combustion with a platinum rhodium catalyst. The NCD uses a cooled chemiluminescence reaction cell because stray infrared radiation would cause a high background. The NCD optical filter is specific to the infrared range. The NCD is not as sensitive as the SCD on a molar basis. The NCD generally has better long-term stability, however. There are multiple vendors and manufacturers of XCDs, which stands for NCD and SCDs. I am most familiar with the Agilent detectors because I helped to develop their predecessors. And even though this presentation is geared toward Agilent instrumentation, the fundamental principles are common across manufacturers. Agilent acquired the Seavers line of detectors from General Electric in 2006. This slide shows the newest model 8355 detector on the left and a complete Agilent GC system with an SCD on the right. Notice the use of gas filters on the upper right side of the detector. I'll mention this again later. Besides Agilent, Shimasu introduced an SCD a few years ago, and Petroleum Analyzer Corporation has manufactured these detectors for decades now. This slide covers the main system components of the detector system, these being the burner, controller, detector, and pump. The pump was not shown on the previous slide, but is shown on this slide in the lower right-hand corner. This system dates from about uh, 2007, and you can see the controller, which controls the flow rates and temperature of the burner, and the detector box, which contains the electronics, ozone generator, photomultiplier tube, and reaction cell. And in the upper right-hand part of this slide is a cross-section of uh, a burner. In, the, in this case, it was the dual plasma burner from about that same time period. This slide is courtesy of Jim Long of Dow with a slight modification. It's a block flow diagram of an Agilent model 8355 SCD, and it shows how the system components are connected. Sample flow exits the column, the sample is converted in the burner, and the combustion products are drawn into the reaction cell with ozone by means of the vacuum generated by the vacuum pump. Hydrocarbons are converted to carbon dioxide and water, which do not chemiluminesce with ozone. I do want to point out that a chemical trap is used before the vacuum pump in order to protect the pump and its oil from ozone. Of course, the pump exhaust should be vented to a hood or some other device, as there is the possibility of oil vapors being emitted. The ozone trap and pump oil are probably the two main 
consumable items of these systems. Work on continuing improvements of this technology. This slide is a side-by-side -side comparison of the detector box before and after Agilent engineering. The upper panels are of the right-hand side of the detector internals, and the bottom panels are of the left-hand sides. Improvements have been made in terms of manufacturability, in addition to reliability and serviceability, as well as safety improvements in isolating high voltages, etc. This slide differentiates the stainless steel burner or single plasma technology from the dual plasma combustion that is currently practiced in the Agilent XCDs. The stainless steel burner configuration is shown on the left, and it basically contains a single plasma or flame combustion zone. The dual plasma technology was created to improve the efficiency of combustion by creating essentially two combustion zones. In the case of the SCD as shown in the middle, the first combustion zone is oxygen rich, and the second combustion zone is hydrogen rich in order to generate sulfur monoxide. In the case of the NCD shown on the right, both combustion zones are oxygen rich, and the second zone is also catalytically enhanced, as mentioned previously. The SCD burner is typically controlled at about 800 degrees C, and the NCD is controlled at about 1000 degrees C. I should note that this is the bulk control temperature, and the temperature of the small plasma zones are much hotter than this, on the order of 2000 degrees C. The chemiluminescence reaction chamber, or reaction cell, is where the chemiluminescence is generated. Here, the burner effluent is mixed with ozone in front of the optical filter and photomultiplier tube, which will be shown in the next slide. The hole in the center of the cell is the exit to the vacuum pump. The volume of the cell is on the order of a few milliliters, but because the cell is operated at below 10 torr, the volumetric flow rate through the cell is quite high, and the residence time in the cell is quite short. This is important because it allows for detection of very fast and narrow peaks to take place, for example, with two-dimensional gas chromatography. A pressure transducer is used to monitor the pressure in the cell and its signal is used for diagnostics and detector control. The reducing union couples the ozone generator with the reaction cell by means of a restrictor. The restrictor is used so that the pressure inside the ozone generator is not too low. There are two O-ring seals. The inner O-ring is for sealing vacuum and the outer one for keeping out background light. This shows how the reaction cell is coupled to the front of the PMT housing. This is an SCD housing, as you can see that the optical filter is blue passing, and the housing is not cooled, as it would be in the case of the NCD. Different PMTs are used that are optimized for red or blue sensitivity. In both cases, the PMT socket has a high voltage connection and a signal connection. The high voltage is on the order of 1000 volts DC. The signal generated is current on the order of picoamps, which is converted in an amplifier to a DC voltage to accommodate the chromatographic data system. In the past, an input board was used to bring the signal into the data system. Now with the Agilent systems, the signals are processed internally for ChemStation, like any other Agilent GC detector would be. I think you can appreciate that there are many components that must operate in concert for successful detector performance. Proper conditions are probably the most important to achieve successful operation. Generally, one should refer to manuals or system help pages for guidance. Similarly, proper preventative maintenance must be followed for optimal performance. These systems are definitely not set it and forget it. Rather, they require regular user attention. It's best for operators to be trained by factory technicians or others so that initial performance is verified to meet manufacturer specifications. If performance is not verified, 
then some kind of corrective action must be taken. It's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into much detail, but I will cover these topics more below and will begin with main contributors to detector problems. In the past, keeping a good instrument logbook was a virtual necessity. Logbooks could provide important system details of what worked best and when changes or problems were encountered. Fortunately, there are internal system logs now and electronic notebooks that can be quite helpful, but I still prefer the old fashioned. I thought I would begin with common contributors to detector problems. These apply to both SCD and NCD, but the NCD is generally more forgiving. The importance of purified gases cannot be overstated. It's important that contaminants be to detectors be kept to a minimum. House air systems are generally not recommended because they almost always contain trace contaminants and water. Presence of water will accelerate the occurrence of corrosion in ozone generators. Of course, contaminants can arise from multiple sources. For example, silica from column bleed combustion and even septum bleed can be problematic. Injecting too large a sample can result in incomplete combustion of solvents or sample matrices. And there may even be metals in some samples, for example, metal carbonyls in samples that contain high levels of carbon monoxide. These will cause a metal oxide deposit to form in combustion tubes, which will cause loss of detector response. Impure gases can cause problems in the combustion in addition to the ozone generation and lack of maintenance is particularly hard on vacuum systems, as are leaks that can cause all kinds of varying problems. And don't forget GC maintenance itself. Active sites are notorious for causing tailing or loss of polar analytes, which sulfur and nitrogen compounds tend to be. Fortunately, there are a variety and range of traps and purifiers that help us get to the purity of gases needed. The use of indicating traps is useful because they can tell us about the purity of our gases. Generally, I would recommend the use of hydrocarbon traps on all gases and moisture traps on air and oxygen, especially to the ozone generator gas. Indicating oxygen traps on the carrier gas would certainly be appropriate. There are even chemical traps specifically designed to remove trace sulfur compounds and their use is recommended. Some users have hydrogen generators and these can work as well as hydrogen sourced from gas cylinders. As an example of a detrimental impact from column bleed, this slide shows that stable SCD response is obtained when the oven temperature is cut below 250 degrees C but when taken to 300 degrees C, the impact of column bleed causes a reduction in response. As a rule of thumb, minimize the upper temperature of the column oven and use low bleed columns in general. It's common to use a thick film polydimethylsiloxane column for sulfur compounds, as these provide good peak shape and separation for volatile sulfur compounds but realize that thick films tend to generate greater bleed. Some columns have been specifically developed to address this, and one example is shown on the next slide. This is an example from Jim Luong for the separation of light sulfur compounds using a DB sulfur SCD column. You can see that the separation and peak shape of these compounds is good. This is an Agilent column that was developed for this purpose and also optimized to generate low bleed. I recall the early development of the SCD, a four micron SPB1 column from Sepelco was favored for many analyses. Neil Johansson would be very happy about the development of this new column. We should consider other sources of, of contamination also. Ferrules can be a source of background contamination, as most graphite naturally contains high levels of sulfur. Various seals, like SEPTA, may be sources of sulfur compounds, in addition to 
silicon-containing compounds that may behave just like column bleed. Gas lines also may contain sulfur contaminants. I recommend the purchase of pre-cleaned tubing instead of trying to solvent clean tubing in your lab. You'll benefit from not having to worry about solvent purity and disposal costs, and vendors typically can do a better job, even though the tubing may seem more expensive in the short term. As briefly mentioned already, analysis of polar compounds can be challenging, and most nitrogen and sulfur compounds are polar, reactive, and susceptible to loss on active sites. Be aware of absorption of analytes from bare metal surfaces or metal deposits. Be aware of dead or unswept volumes. I recommend the use of silco steel or sulfonate treated fittings. Also keep in mind that active sites can exist on used columns and can sometimes be eliminated by cutting off a meter on the head of the column. Also keep in mind that active sites can cause problems on inlets and injection ports. As anyone who has worked in a lab knows, troubleshooting is a necessary skill and some people even find it enjoyable, at least when problems are resolved. In the troubleshooting process, it's sometimes useful to know what led up to the problem or failure. So some might ask, was the failure correlated to a change in operation? Or is there an indication of a specific component that went bad? These highlight the usefulness of instrument logs and logbooks. A logical approach to troubleshooting is probably the best approach, although the shotgun approach is perhaps too commonly used. Try to be open-minded, define the problem, gather information, isolate the source or sources of the problem, verify functions, document the repair and its verification. There are test points and simple functionality tests that can be important for troubleshooting at the component level. But think safety first. Do not attempt repairs unless you have received proper training as high voltages may cause electrocution. Exercise care around high temperature components also to avoid burns. At the board level, there are test points that can be used to diagnose electronic problems. For example, there is a voltage test point that reads the PMT high voltage divided by a factor of 1000. Continuity of resistance of the burner heating element can indicate its failure. The burner thermocouple can be plugged into a meter to determine if it is accurately measuring temperature. Flow rates can be directly measured to verify that controller readings are accurate. When turning the ozone generator on and off, there should be a shift in the baseline due to low level chemical noise. If there is no shift, then suspect a bad ozone generator, high voltage transformer, or even a plug post ozone restrictor. Proper maintenance of the vacuum pump requires replacement of its oil as well as the ozone trap at regular intervals depending on usage. A viable alternative is to use a scroll pump, which obviates the use of oil. Nevertheless, use ozone traps in order to protect the environment and those in it. A manometer may be used to measure and verify vacuum. I hope that this gave you a flavor of the principles, operation, and maintenance of sulfur and nitrogen chemiluminescence detectors for GC. There are many avenues of support to help you meet your lab challenges. Become familiar with your systems through reference to manuals and vendor documentation. Refer to standard test methods for guidance if your analyses fall within their scopes. Conferences and meetings, example ASTM meetings, are great places to meet in person with other users. There are online resources for example, user groups and videos that can help you. Vendors want to help you succeed and service organizations can help you greatly.
Thank you for your interest in this presentation. I've provided my email address below in case you would like to send me any questions or comments. I'd like to leave you with one final thought, and that is science helps us to understand the world around us, but it's up to you to make it better. Thank you.